joining us over your lunch hour or what might be your lunch hour. Uh, just wanted to say a quick thank you to the Office on Violence Against Women, which supports the Stalking Resource Center. I'm a consultant at the Stalking Resource Center. I've been consulting with them for the last eight years, and my full-time job is the Director of Social Change at the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. So we're a couple of different hats, but today I'm um, glad to be here on behalf of the Stalking Resource Center, and I appreciate all of you taking some time out um, of your busy day to join us. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Stalking Resource Center, we provide in-person trainings, um, webinars such as these, um, technical assistance to both individuals and your organizations. We also have tons of fact sheets and brochures, manuals, how-to guides, um, sample policies, et cetera, all on our website. So please check out our website. Um, you'll find lots of helpful information on there for your day-to-day -day work. And I'm happy to send you any additional information um, that we mentioned in this particular webinar. After the webinar, I'll send that all to Josh and he'll send out um, information to you as well as a copy of the PowerPoint. So don't worry, you will get a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, we're gonna start off today talking about exactly what is stalking. And when we talk about stalking, we actually use two different definitions. We use both a behavioral definition and the definition that we have in our state statute. So because the Stalking Resource Center is a national technical assistance provider, we often rely on the behavioral definition of stalking um, because the statutes can change frequently depending on which state you live in. So what we use as a behavioral definition is that stalking is defined as a course of conduct directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to either fear for his or her safety or the safety of others or suffer a substantial emotional distress. And there's a couple of things I'd like to point out to you in particular within this definition. Number one, we say it's a course of conduct and you'll hear me talk today um, and I might refer to it as a pattern of behavior. Uh, I might say it's a course of conduct. What it's important to remember is that when we're talking about stalking, we're talking about a pattern. So usually two or more incidents um, that are occurring that are directed at what we say a specific person. But it's important to remember that when we talk about stalking, we often see that stalking not only affects the individual victim, but also many times will spill over into family members, friends, um, so that if the stalker isn't getting what they want or having the reaction from the victim, they will also start targeting somebody else. And we call that target dispersion. So we see that it's directed at a specific person, but sometimes some of the behaviors also happen to others that are close to the victim. What I'd also point out is that it would, we say that it would cause a reasonable person to fear for their safety or the safety of others. I think one of the things that's really important, um, as many of you are super familiar with working in the sexual assault field, is that we have lots of victims who will oftentimes minimize what's happening to them. And so they may be experiencing a course of behavior that seems really scary to those of us on the outside, um, but victims may have a flat effect um, because of the trauma, or they may just say, yeah, this is happening and it's not really a big deal because it's been happening to them for a long period of time. And so when we say it would cause a reasonable person to fear for his or her safety, one of the things that we wanna keep in mind is that fear can oftentimes mask, uh, be masked by other uh, emotions. So we might have survivors or victims who will articulate that they're angry or they're upset um, or they're um, sick and tired of the behavior that's going on. And a lot of times underneath that is the element of fear but we really have to look closely at what we would call the course of conduct, as well as what we would say is context. So what's been going on in this particular situation and what does it mean to the victim? So I'll give you a ex good example of context. I'm wondering how many of you on the phone with us this morning, or this afternoon actually, would say that they are a little bit afraid of spikes. Like mm, they're not super fond of them. Like, if there was a spider crossing the floor, they might have what some other people might think an overreaction. I'll give you an example. So some of you on the phone might be like the nail in this particular video and think, really, why is this person like jumping up on the back of the couch? Why are they what some might view overreacting to this particular situation. Others of us who are not particularly fond of spiders might be exactly like the female that you just saw who jumped on the top of the back of the couch, was not at all happy about that spider, 
and was scared. And some of you might say, well, I feel like this person's overreacting. But if I said to you, well, what if that female who was jumping up on the back of the couch had before been bitten by a hobo spider and had a bad reaction, had to go to the hospital, and of course, of antibiotics and a hospital stay, would that change your opinion at all? A lot of times it will. A lot of times people will say, well, yeah, that's understandable. What I gave you in this particular situation was context. I gave you more about the story. I gave you more information that helps you try to put in context the behavior that you just saw happen with this particular individual. And so when we talk about stalking, it's extremely important to consider that context is critical. So what might be scary to one person might not be scary to somebody else. Um, what we also have to keep in mind is that something might be frightening for the victim, but you might be on the outside looking at thinking, I don't understand why that's so scary. Um, we also have to keep in mind that lots of stalking behaviors have a specific meaning that's only understood between the offender and the victim. And then we also have to keep in mind that particularly when we talk about stalking and state statutes and being a crime, that stalking often criminalizes what would otherwise be non-criminal behavior. So let me give you an example. It's not a criminal offense to send somebody a text message. It's not a criminal offense to send someone flowers. But if this behavior is occurring within the context of stalking and it's part of that pattern of behavior, it might be. And I think that's one of the things that makes stalking really difficult, not only for victims to try to handle and identify and figure out what their help seeking behavior looks like, but also for those of us that are doing the work. Um, sometimes it's easy to get only what I call like one snapshot of the full picture and not really understand the full movie. So we may only get like one particular incident that's described to us, and we don't look at things within that full course of conduct. So one of the things we need to keep in mind today is that context is critical, and we really need to be thinking about that when we're talking about the intersection between stalking, and especially the intersection between stalking and sexual assault. What we also want to keep in mind is that in addition to the behavioral definition, there's also state statutes. Every single statu um, state in the U.S. has statute against stalking, so all 50 states. Um, there's also federal statutes regarding stalking. So federal statutes um, cover what we call interstate stalking. So if you have a victim who has crossed state lines and the offender follows the victim across state lines or the offender crosses state lines in order to commit the stalking offense, then they're actually guilty of a federal offense, it's a crime called inter interstate stalking which depending on your uh, federal officials sometimes gets investigated and oftentimes does not. Um, what you also need to keep in mind is we have tribal codes. Many tribal codes have um, an element that addresses stalking and then um, the United States uh, military justice program also. So all branches of the military also have codes regarding stalking um, and some pretty significant ones um, that could actually be used as models in other states. So if you're thinking, I don't know what Colorado's stalking statute is, if you go to the Stalking Resource Center's website, we actually have a link to all state statutes on here. So if you just click on the state, um, it'll bring up your state statute. And the reason that we oftentimes will use the behavior definition is there's different elements that make up different levels of stalking. So you might have first degree in some cases, second degree in other cases. But when we talk about providing advocacy and working with stalking victims, it's not so much about the criminal definition, but it's about what the victim experiencing, which is why we use the behavioral definition. If any of you have questions as we go throughout today, um, webinars, I love giving them. It's fantastic that we can have the amount of information given out in a short amount of time. And they're not my favorite because I don't get to see your faces. And I don't know if things are making sense to you or not. So if you have questions as we go through today, please type them in the chat box. Um, Josh is gonna stop and interrupt me every once in a while um, if there's questions coming in to make sure that I get those answered. So please make sure you reach out if there's something on your mind as we're going through today. So let's talk a little bit about the prevalence of stalking. What we know is that 18 to 24 year olds experience the high rate, highest rate of stalking. Since all of you are uh, sexual assault advocates as well, you will see that that age looks pretty familiar. Um, 18 to 24 year olds um, experience the highest rate for a couple of different reasons. Uh, number one, it might be brain development. And so we have individuals who are getting in dating relationships, trying to figure out what the dating relationship stuff looks like. We also have lots of 18 20 to 24 year olds who are residing on college campuses. 
where it's oftentimes easier to monitor and stalk your victim. So keeping that in mind. We know that women are more likely to experience stalking, not surprising, and that most offenders are male. And it's important to keep in mind that most offenders are male regardless of the gender of the, of the victim. And I'll show you that um, a slide that will articulate that in just a second. And then not surprising to many of us who are in the violence against women field that the majority of victims know their offender in some way, shape, or form. So when we talk about the gender offenders, like I said earlier, even if we have a male victim, we are just as likely to have a male offender as a female offender. So if there's any of you that are joining us on the webinar today that are type A personalities and are super frustrated looking at my circles saying, Jennifer, 41 and 43% do not equal 100%. I know that, I promise I'm not that bad at math. <laughs> but what this also accounts for is individuals not being able to identify the gender of the person who's stalking them. So for female victims, in about 67% of the cases, we have a male offender. For female victims, it's about 24% of the case that we have a female offender. But for male victims, it's about half and half. So half, half the time we have a male offender, half the time we have a female offender. And so what happens in many of those cases is we have a female victim who's been stalked by a male offender, and now the stalking has spilled over to the female's new partner, their new boyfriend, their new husband, maybe even a friend. And so the offender, the stalking offender, is not only targeting the female victim, but also targeting another male victim as well. So that accounts for the, the gender differences there. What I'll also tell you is we don't have a ton of great resources um, research about stalking that occurs within the LGBT community. Um, we don't have a lot of great stalking research to begin with, um, and especially when we start to really dig into what are the dynamics, et cetera, um, there's not a lot of great information out there. Um, but this gives you some ideas as far as the um, gender breakout, and then let's also talk about the offender relationship. So we know, not surprisingly, that most victims of stalking are either in a current or former intimate partner relationship with their offender. So for females, you'll see on the bottom there, it's about 61% of the time. For males, it's about 44% of the time. And then you'll see another larger group, such as acquaintance and stranger and family member. And so an example of acquaintance would be, you know, somebody that went to school with, um, somebody that they work with, somebody that they may or may not know by sight, but not necessarily by name. So keeping that in mind as we move through the rest of the presentation, that we see a huge overlap between stalking and domestic violence, um, but we also see the overlap between stalking and sexual assault. And we're going to talk more about that in just a few minutes, but this gives you an idea as far as what some of those breakdowns in relationships are. So let's talk about the specific behavior that happens when stalking. What we know as far as the patterns of behavior is that approximately two thirds of stalkers pursue their victim at least once a week. So this is constant subjection to the fear and not knowing what's happening next. We also know that 78% of stalkers use more than one means of approach. And so that's really important for those of us as advocates to consider when we're working with victims of stalking that we're not just designing our safety plan around just one particular behavior, but around a variety of behaviors. So for instance, if we have a stalker who typically calls the victim and we safety plan around calling and we come up with this great plan, what we need to know is that the minute we cut off the stalker's ability to call the victim, they're just gonna change their approach. And so one of the things we need to think about is oftentimes, um, I will hear advocates advise victims of stalking that just change your phone number because then if they can't reach you, then, you know, they won't be able to get a hold of you. But let's think that through. Do we really think that if a stalker can't reach a victim by phone, that they're going to call, get a disconnected number, the victim doesn't answer, and the stalker is just going to give up? They're like, oh, darn, she's not answering. I guess I'm going to stop stalking. That doesn't happen. <laughs> Instead, what they do is they show up in person or they go on social media and find out stuff about the victim. So keep in mind that that varying approach calls for those of us as advocates to really consider when we safety plan with victims, what might happen next. So even if it isn't a behavior that's already occurred, what might happen and how do we safety plan around that? And then the last thing that you see up there is that weapons are used to harm or threaten victims in about 20% of the cases. Um, if anybody has a guess as to what the most common weapon is in stalking cases, um, many people will say or guess that it's the firearm, 
and in this in fact a knife. Um, stalkers like to be closer to the victims and so if they use a weapon oftentimes they're actually using a knife rather than a firearm. And we know that stalkers don't give up. Um, so recidivism or reoffense occurs in about 60% of stalking cases um, and the time between the intervention. So intervention might be the offender goes to jail or the victim gets a civil protection order or some other type of intervention, the college intervenes. Um, the time between the intervention and the recidivism is usually about two months. Um, in a particular study, it ranged anywhere from a day to six years. And we see this all the time. We know that when we have offenders that are sent to jail, et cetera, oftentimes the first person they're calling is the victim from jail. So keep in mind that um, domestic violence recidivism is about 24 to 60% of the cases. So stalking recidivism is just as high, if not higher, than domestic violence recidivism. So just to put a couple of things in perspective there for all of you on the phone that are familiar with the rates of DV recidivism. But let's also talk about um, how often does the stalking last? For about 30% of the victims, it's about six months or less. And if you just saw the recidivism rate, and we know that stalkers oftentimes don't stop their behavior, oftentimes the duration of the stalking is six months or less because the stalker has moved on to a not new victim, not because they've stopped the behavior. So keeping that in mind, and then we have some stalking victims that we've been working with for 10 or 20 years, um, which obviously can take a, a huge toll on the victim, on their emotional and physical well-being. So we'll talk about some of that um, when we talk about safety planning a little bit later. So when we talk about the offender really varying their tactics, what do they do? Um, the most common is actually to show up some place where the victim's at. Um, I think sometimes our safety planning has, has a tendency to focus around phone calls and text messages, which are super common, and there's also lots of other things that happen. And so just keep in mind that with the variety of tactics that you see up there, that perpetrators will vary that behavior a lot, which is also results in victims feeling super unbalanced and not knowing what's gonna happen next. Um, we see hypervigilance and stalking victims at a really high rate because stalking victims aren't sure where the offender is gonna show up again or what might happen. They feel like they're constantly looking over their shoulder. And so we have lots of victims who are suffering that emotional impact of stalking simply because the tactics change so frequently. Some of the tactics that you all might be super familiar with um, are things like using the kids, so if they are a current or former intimate partner, um, using kids to gather information about the non-defending parent, like where was mommy last night? Who was mommy talking on the phone to? Um, they might use kids um, to deliver technology to monitor the victim, and we'll talk about some of the technologies that are used in, in just a moment. Um, we oftentimes see stalking offenders use the legal system. So they'll call the police on the victim. I worked with a victim one time um, who when she was younger, had a drug and alcohol history, um, and so had convictions of drug abuse and disbursement. And, um, so when she and her partner split, one of the things that he would do is when she moved to a new town is he would call law enforcement there and say, hey, you have a druggie that's moved into your town and she's probably making meth in the basement. You should probably go over and check on her. And of course he would call law enforcement at like two o'clock in the morning and report, you know, like a meth house. And so law enforcement would obviously get their attention um, and would go over there and knock on the door. And she and her child were in there sleeping. She didn't use drugs currently, um, but it was a way that he tried to use the system against her over and over and over again. And she got really frustrated. Um, and it was really difficult for her to feel like she was ever going to live in a place um, where she was safe. We also see proxy stopping, stopping happen um, where we know that um, perpetrators are getting other people involved. So when we say proxy stalking, that means so perhaps the stalker himself is not doing the stalking, but perhaps they're getting other people to give information. I and mean, then sometimes that's willingly and sometimes it's unwillingly. It might be things like, um, I actually had a case where the offender was getting lots of information from the older gentleman who lived across the street. So he would um, talk to their neighbor and, and ask questions about like, you know, whose car has been over here and what time does she usually get home from work? And the, the um, older gentleman was just carrying on a conversation and not realizing that they were actually providing information uh, to the stalker. So keeping that in mind. And then of course we see order of protection violations frequently in stalking cases. And you can go ahead and look at the numbers there. 
um, but it's not uncommon for offenders to violate that order of protection. And then we see all the different forms of technology that are used to stalk, um, which would be an entire different webinar. Um, but some of the things that I want to just point out to you is obviously we see phones used so often, GPS devices, uh, social networking sites are becoming huge. And then we have things like spyware. So if you're not familiar with spyware, spyware is just something that you can put on a computer or a cell phone that monitors something the other person does all the time. So you can see the text messages that are sent, you can see the emails that are sent, you can see the phone calls that come in. Um, and I'll talk with you more later about um, the different technologies that are used and how do you safety plan about around that and how do you find out more information about what those technologies might even be. Uh, so we can certainly explore that. And we can always think about perhaps another webinar if that's an interest for all of you as well. So let's talk about the overlap then between um, stalking and sexual assault, and where does that intersection happen? We see it happen in pretty much three different ways. Number one, either the stalker threatens to sexually assault the victim. Sometimes we see that the stalker attempts to get somebody else to assault the victim. Um, and then we actually have when the stalker actually sexually assaults the victim. I think where we've gone wrong as a movement is oftentimes when we're trying to figure out the intersection between stalking and sexual assault, we oftentimes ask stalking victims if they've been sexually assaulted. Well, we know, obviously, that people don't want to disclose sexual assault at a very high rate, um, and so we see those numbers pretty low. But what we should also be thinking about is asking those individuals that we work with who have experienced sexual assault if they've also experienced stalking behavior. So keeping in mind what some of those things might be, um, so when I talked about like what does threatening sexual assault look like, this is just an example of an individual case. So this individual had actually been stalking about 1,200 people across Canada and the United States. And what he would do was call these females on the phone, um, threaten very explicit threats about sexual assault and rape. Um, some of the calls were to women that he knew. Some of them were calls to women that he didn't know. And so when they finally caught him, he was jailed for sexually assaulting three of the individuals that he was calling and threatening, but they found a record of more than 1,200 individuals that he was contacting over and over and over again. And so he would get some of their phone numbers from social media sites. Sometimes it was people he knew. Sometimes um, he was hacking into databases and getting phone numbers from there. So he had quite the history of threatening sexual assault and then actually committed sexual assault against some of those individuals. Um, when I mentioned sometimes we have offenders who try to get somebody else to sexually assault a victim. Some of you might be familiar with this case that happened in Wyoming where this particular offender, offender had been dating um, the victim and when he broke up, well, when the victim broke up with him, his form of retribution was to then post an add on Craigslist saying that the victim had a fantasy about being sexually assaulted. And so he posted an ad on Craigslist and then people actually responded to, to that um, Ad. And so what happened is he posted that ad, this woman opened up the door and an individual was at her house, that person forced their way in there, um, they sexually assaulted her, um, and so they ended up arresting the person who sexually assaulted her, but they also ended up charging her ex-boyfriend with sexual assault charges as well as an accomplice to the sexual assault. Um, so that's a pretty extreme example, but think about all the time that the stories that we hear from survivors um, who may use the words like revenge porn. Um, that's not my particular favorite uh, way of categorizing that information because it's not usually about revenge and it's not pornography, but they may take things, um, intimate pictures that they took with the victim together and suddenly put, put it up on social media sites. It might be a way to stalk the victim, it might be a way of, it, of revenge. And so keeping in mind that oftentimes when we have cases like that, we don't necessarily identify that behavior as stalking behavior. But if we broke it down, it is, of course, a conduct that's directed at a specific person that causes that person fear. They're afraid for their safety. They're afraid for their emotional well-being. And so keeping in mind that that's a tactic that we see a lot of individuals who are stalkers use, and it's a form of sexual violence. And so how can we help safety plan with victims who are experiencing this, and how do we assist them when stuff like this happens? Um, I imagine many of you are seeing what I would describe as a pretty big rise in that type of behavior um, within the last few years, especially as social media sites become more and more um, prolific. We see that distributed. Any questions so far for me, Josh? Uh, 
No questions, just a lot of uh, thank you awesome. in saying that this is great thus far. Awesome, perfect, okay. I hope they're really saying that, you're not just telling me that, Josh. <laughs> all right, so let's also talk about the steps and steps all of you know, you can teach it better than I do. What are some of those common societal um, misbeliefs about rapists? And we have lots of things like, you know, they're a certain person and they act a certain way, et cetera. And so really trying to understand when we talk about the link between um, sexual assault and stalking, that a lot of the information that we have about those people who commit sexual assault comes from individuals who've actually been caught and are in jail for sexual assault offenses. So they get the, the information, the research from those people who actually got caught, which in my opinion, isn't the best place for us to get research because those are the offenders that were quite frankly dumb enough to get caught um, or committed such an egregious offense. But we all know working in the sexual assault field, that there's a huge number of individuals who never get caught for sexual offenses. And so when we're looking at some of the research, um, many of you are probably familiar with Dr. Lubeck's work on the undetected rapist. And one of the things out of his work that's, I think, really important and often get, times gets missed, even by those of us who are in the sexual assault field, um, is the link between the stalking behavior that happens before and after a sexual assault. So for those of you that are not familiar with Dr. Lubeck's research, um, essentially what he did is conduct interviews with approximately um, 1,800 men at a college campus asking them if they've ever had sexual assault with somebody um, when they didn't want to and did you use physical force? Well, um, the good news, as many of you know, is that only 120 of those individuals met the criteria for rape. So a majority of males are not sexual assault offenders, but other than 120, 76 reported committing multiple offenses. Um, and in fact, they had a total of about 483 rapes each. So an approximately, an average of 5.8 sexual offenses, um, each of them. So keeping in mind that they also admitted to a bunch of other information, um, like battery and physical assault. But when he looked at those multiple um, rape offenders, when he looked at those offenders who were committing multiple offenses, what he also found, in addition to all of the offenses that you see listed up on the screen, he also found that with these particular individuals, they were engaging in a course of conduct that also constituted stalking. So those offenders would say things like they premeditated and planned their attacks. Um, if you've ever seen the what many people call the Frank video, the interview that Dr. Lisak does with this particular offender, the offender says, yeah, you know what? We scoped out individuals that we thought were vulnerable. We scoped out individuals that we thought lacked credibility. And we scoped out individuals um, that we thought that we could um, commit an offense on that we would never get caught. And they oftentimes use multiple strategies to make that victim vulnerable. So they picked victims who were really young, they picked victims who were freshmen, um, victims who might not have a great social support system. They might have picked victims who lacked credibility. So perhaps the victim um, had a disability or perhaps the victim was known to be a drinker on campus something that would make them vulnerable and lack credibility in the eyes of other people. Um, and they only used violence really as needed. Um, and so many times because they used alcohol deliberately, their victim was incapacitated. So they found out and scoped out their victims. They gathered information on these individuals. Um, Frank actually uses the word, we prepped our victims um, in the video. And if you haven't seen it, I highly encourage you to. Um, and what they also um, found as common characteristics is that those individuals had really hyper-masculine attitudes. Um, they saw intimate violence as normal. They didn't think it was any big deal to sexually assault the women that they were sexually assaulting. Um, they didn't have any apathy for the individuals whatsoever. Um, and then if we break that down and we look at their behavior and we say, okay, we have instances where people are following and they're gathering surveillance information and they're gathering information and then they commit a sexual assault, is this behavior also stalking? And so one of the things I want you to think about is when you're working with victims of sexual assault, oftentimes we are identifying, you know, and safety planning about what's the potential in getting sexually assaulted by this person again, but we also need to be looking at what are our safety plans around the behavior that might constitute stalking. Because what we usually see is a sexual assault offender who will do all of this, who will sexually assault the victim, and then they're making post-assault contacts. They're calling the victim and saying, 
Why are you telling people that I sexually assaulted you? Why are you telling people that this happened? Or they might say, you know, I had a really great time. Thanks. You want to come again to a party? You want to go out again? Or they may be threatening the victim and saying things like, I can't believe you are telling everybody that I sexually assaulted you. You were all over me. All the things that we all hear every single time um, as sexual assault victim advocates. But thinking about that in a new way, does that also constitute stalking behavior? And some of you might be saying, well, what does it matter what we call it? Well, one of the things you need to keep in mind is the safety planning might look different. Um, and we might have another crime. I don't know what things are like in Colorado, but here in Idaho, our sexual assault crimes don't get prosecuted. <laughs> they often fall into what people want to categorize as a he said, she said, uh, which that language really bothers me. And we have a whole other discussion about that. Um, but keeping in mind that oftentimes we have sexual assault offenses that can't get, according to the system, can't get proven. And we have victims who are really upset by that. Um, we've got some really inventive detectives across the country who are looking at that particular case and saying, maybe I can't charge the sexual assault offense, but do I also have a course of conduct that constitutes stalking? And in many instances, that stalking might also be a felony offense. And so can I charge both? Um, and if your prosecutors are anything like some prosecutors are, sometimes the more charges that you have, um, the more likelihood it is that something might stick. And so we have some sexual assault victims across the country who are having their cases looked at as a stalking offense in addition to the sexual assault offense. Um, and the stalking offense is actually sticking because the perpetrator will say, well, yeah, I did sexually assault her, but yeah, I called her and yeah, I sent her the sex message and yeah, I told her she better shut her mouth afterwards, that type of a thing. So keeping in mind that sometimes um, when we have that course of behavior that we all know is super familiar to us um, and something that sexual assault offenders engage in all the time, this might also actually be a course of conduct that constitutes stalking. And so then how do we safety plan and help victims um, figure out what to do next um, and what kind of resources can we give them? Um, and one of the things that people often ask, um, particularly around the intersection of stalking and sexual assault is why does this happen? Um, sometimes it's, it happens because the stalkers are seeking a relationship with a victim. Um, most often it happens because of the power and control, which we're all familiar with. Sometimes that happens um, because the stalker feels rejected by the victim. Some be sometimes because they've become obsessed with the victim um, and they are planning to commit a crime like in a sexual assault. Um, and oftentimes, frankly, because they can, because they get away with the behavior because none of us identify it as stalking. Um, I know that I worked in the domestic violence and sexual assault field for several years before I began to identify the behavior that many of the individuals that I was working with as stalking. I, if it was a domestic violence relationship, I chalked it up to really jealous and controlling behavior. I would say things like, oh, that person's really jealous, or they're really controlling, or they're really obsessive, or they're really possessive. I didn't call it stalking. Or when I had situations like the undetected rapist situations where we have individuals who are engaged in that form of conduct, I just chalked it up to part of the sexual assault conduct and didn't necessarily identify it as stalking behavior. And the reason I encourage you to think about that is because we also need to be considering the impact that the stalking behavior is having, as well as what, of our, what are some of our options for those victims as far as safety planning. And so one of the elements that some state statutes have um, is the element of fear or distress um, for victims. And those of us that are advocates are really good at understanding what that looks like and feels like. But it's also about helping us understand how do we help Victims communicate that if they're reporting it to law enforcement or if they're seeking help from their um, campus security system or they're reaching out to other systems. Um, what does that distress look like? So sometimes they're verbalizing it and saying things like, you know, it's, um, it's really creeping me out. One of the things that I often um, will ask stalking victims is, how has your routine changed? What has changed for you? Um, what behaviors have changed for you? And we'll get answers for things like I can't sleep and I can't eat or I've changed the way I go to class or you know I don't take night classes anymore because I'm afraid of walking across the parking lot at night. Things like that can also help us um, demonstrate that distress or fear that might um, be needed in some of these particular cases regarding safety plan or reporting it. 
Um, obviously, we have individuals who are reporting it to law enforcement or college situation. Um, that demonstrates that they've reached the level where they feel like they need somebody um, to be able to help them. They need some type of intervention. So when we're working with victims, what are some of the things that we need to discuss with, uh, with uh, stalking victims? I think the most important one and the one that's really hard is how do we balance freedom and safety? And so oftentimes when stalking victims will disclose to other people the behavior that they're experiencing, people say things like, well, why are you answering your phone? Um, or why would you be on Facebook? Or why would you be on Snapchat? Like, why don't you just get rid of those things? Um, which we all know um, from the advocacy perspective is that so for many of the individuals that we're working with, those same things like a phone or social media, et cetera, are also where they get their support. And so if we take those things away or we ask them to stop using them, number one, it's not realistic. And number two, we just isolate them further. And so how do we balance their freedom to move around and do what they want to with their safety? Um, and I think those of us, um, that our advocates can really engage in those discussions with other systems folks, because it's been my experience that, you know, um, college safety officers or police officers are very quick to say, well, just don't answer the phone or just don't use social media um, and helping them understand why that's not a realistic expectation um, and how that just isolates the victims further is really important job for those of us as advocates. I think it's also important to discuss with victims um, what's next. Um, what, what are your next steps in case something happens? How do we safety plan around that? Um, and how often do we reassess that safety plan? Because the perpetrator, as we mentioned earlier, is constantly changing their tactics. And then what does risk reduction look like versus absolute safety? I mean, the, the, the reality is if a stalker wants to access a victim, they're going to be able to get to the victim no matter what kind of safety plan we put in place. And so how do we reduce the risk, but also be able to let the victim have their life, like be able to do things that they normally do? How do we as a system help make them safer? I think one of the things that we um, sometimes err on as advocates, um, and maybe some of you can relate, or maybe it was just me, maybe, uh, maybe I'm the only advocate in the world who's ever made a mistake. Um, but I used to often tell victims of stalking, document what happened. And that was my instruction, document it or keep a journal, but I never really told them what to keep a journal on. So I would have victims of stalking come in and they would literally have like a 500 page journal. Because I said document and keep a journal, so they could document and keep a journal. And then if we were to the point where we were trying to give that to a campus security guard or law enforcement or something that as documentation of what has happened, you can imagine the look on the face of the detective when we hand over a 500 page journal and say, here, read this, this, should, this will tell you everything you need to know about the case. Um, I'm surprised they didn't throw me out of their offices. So what instead would be a little bit more helpful um, would be what we call a stalking incident log. And you can get this log on our stalking resource center website, free to download, adjust it as you need it. What you will notice that we have on here are the date, the time, the description of the incident, the location of the incident, what we see in stalking crimes is that jurisdictions, if you're going to use the law enforcement term, um, vary frequently. So we may have a victim who attends a college campus in one jurisdiction, lives in another jurisdiction, goes to see her mom in another jurisdiction, and works in another jurisdiction. So we have four, four different jurisdictions. And perhaps the victim has reported the incident before. And so she reports the incident um, to law enforcement where she works. And then she ends up reporting another incident where she lives. And she doesn't understand, from the victim's standpoint, why the two law enforcement offices don't have the report from the other law enforcement office. They think that you know, law enforcement just shares all this information. Night shift probably doesn't know what day shift is doing, let alone one jurisdiction knowing what another jurisdiction is knowing. And so this helps victims um, be able to bring all that information together, because essentially, when we talk about stalking crime, stalking is the only crime where we really rely on victims to gather all their own evidence. Because the stalker is not there when people arrive. And so we're essentially saying to victims, it's your responsibility to gather all this information. And so if you're keeping a log like this, um, one of the things that I coach victims that I work with a lot on are when we talk about witnesses, that's not just who may have seen things, but who may have heard things. Who are they talking to on the phone? Who are they FaceTiming? Um, who may have seen him drive by, that type of a thing. 
Um, and if the police recalled, what was the report number? Um, depending on the jurisdiction, not all of these reports end up getting filed as a report, but might be like an incident only report. And so when we're trying to gather information, sometimes we, we can't find it. Um, what you'll also notice, and sometimes the question that I get with these incident logs is, well, how come we're not writing down how it made the victim feel? Especially if that's an element of our stalking statute. It's been my experience that stalking victims don't forget how they felt. They may forget what particular day it happened or what particular time or who was there, exactly what happened, but they don't forget how it made it feel, made them feel. And especially if we're using this in a campus um, adjudication process or we are using it um, to provide to law enforcement, we all know that if we give it to them, eventually the defense, the stalker, gets it. And so if we have a victim who's writing down on the stalking log, you know, it doesn't really bother me when he shows up at my house, but it really bothers me when he shows up at work. And that's so embarrassing. We all know the next thing the stalker is going to do is show up at her work because that's the most emotionally distressing. So we don't want to give stalkers any more information, which is why we don't have the feelings listed on that particular log. Hope that answers some questions that usually come up for some folks. Um, so again, feel free to use this. You can get it at the Talking Resource Center's website. Um, I'll also send a, a hard copy um, to Josh so he can send that out when he sends out the PowerPoint. Um, and feel free to copy it. There's no copyright law. You use it as well, however you want to. And then when we talk about safety planning for victims, um, what's the threat of imminent harm or danger? What do we think might happen next, um, either for the victim or for others close in their life? One of the things that's really difficult with stalking crimes is there's often um, a want, a need from law enforcement or other systems responders to say, you need to tell the perpetrator that this contact is unwanted. You need to tell, tell the stalker, stop contacting me. We all know that that sounds great and it might be super difficult, especially if the stalker is a current or former intimate partner um, because you bring in all of the dynamics of domestic violence there. And we also know that victims are really good at identifying what kind of challenges that that, that might present. So I worked with a victim one time who said, um, who, whose detective was super upset about the case and, and the detective called me and he said, I'm really frustrated because we, the victim has said to the stalker, leave me alone um, and has not had any contact and I'm pulling her phone record um, to be able to use in the court case with her permission and stuff. And I have an incident at two o'clock in the morning where she answered his phone call and she talked to him for two hours. And the detective was really upset. He got his case was blown. He said, I don't understand this. And I said, well, first of all, have you asked the victim why she answered the phone? He's like, well, no, I called you first. <laughs> I said, well, okay, why don't you ask her why she answered the phone? Um, so he goes to talk to the victim, um, and the victim says, yeah, I answered the phone at 2 o'clock in the morning because that's when he gets done with his shift. Her offender was a law enforcement officer, and so he got off his swing shift at 2 o'clock in the morning, and if she didn't answer the phone, he would come over to her house, and he would tap on her window with his hand up. And so she answered at 2 o'clock in the morning because she said, I answered the phone, I talked to him, I heard him go home, he was on the phone with me when he got home, and then I knew he'd fall asleep and he wouldn't come over tonight and I'd be safe. So keeping in mind that it's really easy for those of us to say, oh, you know, don't have any contact, it's a lot easier. And we know that stalkers get reinforced, even by intermittent contact, but it's not always that easy. And so just keeping in mind that when we're working with victims to say, hey, it's not uncommon that you're going to have to have contact with him. It makes things a little bit harder, but you have to be honest with us when that happens and tell us why. Um, because sometimes victims will try to negotiate, right? But we know that if a stalker calls 42 times and the victim answers on the 43rd time, the next time the stalker calls, they're going to let it ring at least 43 times because they had that intermittent contact with the victim. Um, so keeping in mind that we can recommend that disengagement and no contact, but we all know it's not that easy. Um, and so sometimes our challenge is how do we explain that um, to other system providers. For some victims, um, they can look at some of the safety tools like putting up a picture of the offender, um, talking to other people like their employers, their neighbors. What's often hard in intimate partner stalking cases is um, people might not know that the offender's not supposed to be there. Um, I've had lots of stalking cases where the victim and the offender have broken up and neighbors see the offender breaking into her house all the time, but they think, well, 
he's supposed to be there. Like, yeah, I saw him open a window. I figured he forgot his key. Like, he's been living there before. Um, but keeping in mind that for some victims, they don't want the attention. They don't want anybody to know. They're embarrassed. And so that's not always an easy thing to do. Um, but then is it possible to talk about safety accommodations at work and school and housing? Um, and again, that's a conversation that you all are really skilled at with survivors is about who do you want to tell? What do you think is going to happen if you tell? Um, what are some of the emotional repercussions for you of feeling embarrassed, et cetera? Um, and talking through some of those things. But I don't need to give you all points that on because you're better experts um, than most folks. So also thinking about is an order of protection a safety tool that can we use? Can it enhance the victim's safety? And one of the things I always ask the victims that I work with is, what do you think ha is going to happen if you get a, a protection order? And for some victims, they're like, that's going to stop. Like, he's not going to want that attention. And others are like, I don't care. It's be safer. Um, so really talking through what are the options? What do we think is going to happen? Um, we know that, like all of you, I don't need to tell you again that orders of protection aren't uh, the best safety tool out there. Sometimes they're a tool that we can use if the victim thinks that that's going to be um, something that's helpful for them. Um, but it, again, going back to what their pro, the pros and cons with victims, what do they think is going to happen? And then just the realities of what the protection order can and cannot do. So when we talk about safety planning, what does that look like and how is that different than the safety planning that we might do with victims of domestic violence? It's, it's not all that different. Um, it's a lot of the same elements, but really focusing on when we talk about safety plans, how are we also helping? Um, most victims will say that the thing that they really need is information. Like, how do I prepare and predict my, what, what might happen? How do I know what a criminal justice process might look like? What are some of my safety options with housing? What are some of my safety options at my college? Um, what kind of report can I make if this person, um, you know, shows up at my house? That type of a thing. So really, um, I don't ever advocate that safety plan is a piece of paper. Um, I think safety plan is a verb, not a noun. Um, this is an example a, of a tool that could be used when you talk about safety planning and really identifying what the problem is and there are things that increase the risk and who else might be affected. Um, and what might help. So if you have a victim who works night shift and they get off at two o'clock in the morning, they walk across an empty parking lot, is there a security person that can escort them out? I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because you guys are all really good at this, um, but just thinking about when I said earlier that stalkers will oftentimes change their strategy, really thinking about um, that we're not safety planning from the point of um, just one different behavior that the stalker is engaging in, but a variety of those behaviors. Um, and again, safety planning is a verb, so it's something we're doing over and over and over again, especially because the tactic, tactics often change. And then let's talk about some of the resources, um, resources that we have available at the Stalking Resource Center that you might find helpful for the individuals that you're working with. Um, some of the things that I highly recommend, um, you can look on our website. We've got great information about educational programming, both awareness and prevention, um, and some bystander information. For those of you that are not familiar, January Stalking Awareness Month, so it's a great opportunity to bring awareness about stalking um, and stalking and the intersection of sexual assault. Um, the other thing that I can encourage you to think about is if you have a college campus that's in your jurisdiction, the Clery Act has expanded um, from including just sexual assault as an area of education and awareness to also include stalking and domestic violence. And so this is a perfect opportunity to go to your college campus and say, hey, we would love for you to meet the new Clery regulations that require that you have annual educational programming. Can we come in as an agency and provide that for you? Because um, it's against the law for them not to do it. Um, so sometimes that's our best way to get in the door. Um, we also have great information on some of the services and resources for victims, um, additional training that's available out there. Um, there's information on there about how do you run a stalking support group, et cetera. So lots of really great information. We also have uh, videos that you can use on the Stalking Resource Center website. So things that um, do really quick, um, like 10 minute videos on understanding stalking behaviors and how do you take reports, that kind of stuff. If you're working with law enforcement can be a great way um, to use some of these videos for like roll call trainings, et cetera. Um, and the videos are free to use on our website. So please check them out. Um, I think you might find them beneficial. The other thing that we um, struggle with when we're working with stalking victims is we've got the National Domestic Violence Hotline, we've got the National Sexual Assault Hotline, um, but we don't have a National Stalking Hotline. 
Um, Victim Connect, which is run out of DC, um, is a resource center for all victims of crime. So any crime, not just stalking, but they're well versed and well trained in working with victims of stalking. So providing this phone number might be a great option. Um, some of you are saying, well, why would I do that? When I have my own hotline number, for those of us that work in rural areas, we may have individuals who aren't reaching out to our, our hotline because they're afraid of us answering the phone because we're their neighbor or we're their sister or whatever. Um, this provides a national venue for them to be able to contact. Um, and then those individuals who answer the hotline try really hard to connect them with our local program. Um, but keep in mind that sometimes what we see happen in domestic violence and sexual assault programs is they end up screening out sexual or stalking victims because they might not meet their qualifications. So you may have a hotline volunteer who says, well, I'm sorry for answering that, but the person who's doing this to you isn't a current or former intimate partner, so it's not domestic violence, so I'm not really sure how we can help you. Or you might have a sexual assault victim that the stalking behavior hasn't been identified, and so they don't necessarily think about what are the options for the stalking behavior that they're experiencing within the context of the sexual assault behavior. The other thing that I would um, mention to you, and I would encourage all of you to get out your phones and download this right now. Um, if you're not familiar with all the forms of technology that are used um, to stalk, this app is excellent. It's put out by the National Network to End Domestic Violence. It's called Tech Safety. It's available on the Apple Store, on Google Play, on Android. It's free. Um, and what it does is walk you through a lot of the different forms of technology. So you can get on there and you can say, you know, I think somebody's impersonating me. Um, somebody's sent out photos of me. Um, I'm worried my cell phone's been compromised. And you can get on there and it'll walk you through some of the things that might be happening and help you identify that technology. But it'll also help you safety plan around those particular things. So while it not, might not be safe for a survivor to put this on their phone, um, if we're worried that the offender has access to their phone, it's awesome for you to have it on your phone as an advocate. So you can go through those different things um, when you're working with somebody and help safety plan around some of the technologies that are used out there. Um, I have it on my phone. I use it all the time. Um, I think it's super helpful um, and it's really intuitive. Um, victims really seem to like it and be able to access it even when they're in crisis. So I think that's really important and a great tool for those of us that are doing advocacy work to be able to have um, in our tool belt. So another one that I would highly recommend. And then I want to just ask, open it up um, and see if you all have any questions. You can take a few minutes to type in questions to Josh, um, and I would love to answer those. Um, what I would also encourage you to do is if you need additional technical assistance or information, please reach out to the Stalking Resource Center's website. Um, the information's on there, our phone number's on there as well. Um, keeping in mind that we are a national office right now with um, a staff of one. <laughs> uh, so for those of us that are consultants, we're also helping out as much as we possibly can. Um, we're in between some OVW funding right now, which all of you can, I'm sure can relate to. Um, so hopefully we'll be um, have a more robust staff soon, but um, those folks that are answering at the office do a really great job and we're happy to get you connected with any information we can provide in addition to the information that's on our website. So. Josh, do people have any questions for me? We don't have any that have come through um, yet. A lot of, well, let me see here. Some are starting to pop up. Okay. I think we're going to take a few minutes. I am supporting someone who is being stalked by a neighbor in an HOA neighborhood, and they are getting a lot of runaround. Mm. Uh, yeah. So... Yeah, is there a second part of that question or just the? Uh, do you have any resources and how to help them? Perfect. So one of the things that you can um, be thinking about, especially in those neighbor situations, is is it a possibility to get a trespass warning against the neighbor that um, if the neighbor trespasses again that uh, law enforcement can arrest them? Is a civil protection order um, an option? Um, the documentation log can be really helpful and try to gather the documentation they need in those particular cases. Um, those can be, the, in particular neighbor cases can be really hard because oftentimes um, they'll get brushed off as harassment and not viewed as stalking. One of the conversations that I have a lot with responders is what's the difference between harassment and, what's, and stalking and really helping them understand that in stalking there's the element of fear, fear for someone's emotional safety, fear for their physical safety. Um, and helping them come up with the language that they need 
sometimes opens the doors to some of the resources that can be um, accessed. So if they're not even identifying the behavior of stalking in, to begin with, you might not be getting the response from either the homeowner association or law enforcement because we're not using similar language. Um, so think about the documentation log as an option. Um, one of the things that can be really hard, especially in neighbor situations, is the neighbor may be coming onto the lawn or accessing the property when the victim is not there. Um, deer cams are super helpful if you're like, what did she just say? Um, the cameras that you use in hunting situations, um, those of us that are hunters call them deer cams. So you can mount them on a tree or something and they turn on and monitor video surveillance um, when there's motion that goes by them. Um, I've found those particularly helpful when we have victims who know that the offender is getting into their house somehow, but it never happens when they're there. Um, and oftentimes the offender will just get in and like move things around, not really take anything. So the victim feels like they're starting to, um, they start to feel crazy. They feel like, I don't know what's going on. I know they've been here. I don't have any proof that they've been here. So um, webcams can, the, the deer cam can be super helpful and those are cheap. They're like 30 bucks on Amazon. Um, and a victim can just install them on their own property and perhaps catch some of the video surveillance that they need in those particular situations. So hopefully that's helpful. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, yeah. There was one question about a recording for the video. So yes, uh, this is being recorded and you will be able to find that on our uh, the CCASA YouTube channel and a link to the video will be in that follow-up email that has been mentioned. Um, there aren't any other content related questions that I'm seeing uh, that are coming through and we are just about out of time. I want to give everybody just another minute to ask a question, but I just want to thank you so much again, Jennifer, for all of this great information. And I wasn't lying. There have been multiple thank yous and this is great information that have come through throughout the presentation. Yay, that's nice to hear. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of you who spent your time with me today. Um, I know that you have busy work. I know that you have essential work. Um, and I so appreciate the work that you do on behalf of survivors. So please continue to take care of yourself. Um, continue to do the work because we need you in this field. And if there's anything that we at the Stalking Resource Center can do to support you, please let us know. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And You're welcome. Before I let everyone go, I just want to mention the next webinar through CICASA happening this month, and it's going to be on September 27th at 12 p.m., presented by the Blue Bench staff, and it's going to be discussing supporting secondary survivors. So be on the lookout for the registration link as uh, email for that will happen multiple times before the date of the 27th. And just thank you all again for attending. Um, please reach out to Jennifer if you have any follow-up content-related questions. If you have any ideas about webinars you'd like to see, please reach out to me at josh at cicasa.org and be looking out for that follow-up email. Thank you all so very much.